Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here on this warm, almost summer night. It's great to see you. And we're here to honor Marie Colvin and her extraordinary legacy. I'm Sarah Baxter, and I'm director of the Marie Colvin Center here at Stony Brook, and a former colleague of Marie's at the Sunday Times of London. Marie was killed in Syria in 2012 for her truth-telling and commitment to the victims of war. She always put their trauma and suffering before her own, but Marie, and far too many journalists are often reluctant to acknowledge the toll this sometimes takes on their own mental health. We want to highlight and find solutions to this pervasive hidden problem. I'd also like us to think tonight about Evan Gershkovich of the Wall Street Journal. He's currently in jail in Moscow, accused of spying. And although his situation is very different to Marie's, they both involve the deliberate targeting of journalists by hostile regimes to prevent us from hearing the truth. Journalism is not a crime. We stand with Evan. I want to thank the School of Communication and Journalism and its tremendous dean, Laura Lindenfelt, here in the front row with us tonight. Hello, Laura. Oh. Yeah, of course it is. Anyway, thank you, Laura, and the school for hosting this event. And also our wonderful co-sponsors, the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health at the Renaissance School of Medicine and the Department of Psychology at the College of Arts and Sciences, both here at Stony Brook. And we're very honored to have Kat Colvin here, the inspirational founder of the Colvin Center. And Marie's beloved sister, who, by the way, sounds just like Marie. <laughs> Hello, Kat. On a side note, if you value important conversations like this one, supporting journalists, I hope you'll consider donating to the center. And you may have already been presented with one of those cards that are flying around. They have a QR code that take you directly to the School of Communication and Journalism, and from there to a drop-down menu, mentioning the Marie Colvin Memorial Fund. But now to the main event. I'm delighted to welcome Carl Lejway, the distinguished provost of Stony Brook University and a clinical psychologist who, very remarkably, went to Iraqi Kurdistan to train therapists to help survivors of torture and trauma after Saddam Hussein's fall. Welcome, Carl. Thank you, Sarah. This is a really remarkable event, and I am very privileged to be here speaking with you tonight about it. To all of our guests, thank you for coming out on this beautiful night, uh, beautiful day, beautiful night. We're kind of in the middle, but it is a real treat that we have for us tonight, and it, it is an opportunity to, to kind of dig into things that we don't always talk about, things that we don't always see, and things that we don't always acknowledge. And if we start with just the idea of what war and conflict and what trauma mean, the impact they have on societies, the impact that they have on individuals. And I certainly never thought about the impact on journalists. I went through most of my career and quite frankly, would have never even, it would have never crossed my mind, partially because as Sarah said, there is a reluctance to talk about it. Now I would call it a bravery. I would call it a fierce commitment and a clarity of purpose, but nonetheless, it translates and it expresses itself in a lack of expression. And one of the things we know about trauma is that one of the best ways to try to overcome it is to talk about it, is to expose yourself to it, is to make yourself vulnerable. And in so many ways that goes so against 
what so many brave journalists do and who they are. So you can see this incredibly tough situation that they are put in. The first time I ever realized it was when I, I did go to Iraqi Kurdistan and there were several journalists who were some of the patients that were going to be treated in this kind of first wave of thinking about ways in very low resourced environments to support individuals who had experienced torture, all sorts of trauma. And you could see the reluctance to talk about it. You could see how hard that was going to be. And when I had returned to the University of Maryland at the time, I actually spent a semester with a faculty member in the School of Journalism who was interested in this, who had put themselves into these challenging situations. And it was so, quite frankly, traumatizing for this individual that they never finished the book because it was, it was so, it cut against everything that felt mission driven for this person. And so if you think about what it means to experience what we call post-traumatic stress disorder, this crippling, this, this challenging situation when you're in trauma, we also think about traumatic growth. And to be quite frank, we have no idea what is the difference maker between those who are able to become stronger because of that trauma Many of us have spent a lot of our career trying to understand this and, and quite frankly have failed pretty miserably, but we're moving in the right direction because we have more individuals who are willing to talk about this, who are willing to put themselves into that vulnerable spotlight. And that is why events like this are so important tonight. And that is why I'm so grateful of, for the School of Communication and Journalism, Psychology, Psychiatry, everyone who's here tonight. This is an opportunity to celebrate Marie's legacy. It is also an opportunity for us to think about how we move forward as a community, how we reduce stigma, and how we provide a safe place for individuals who we desperately need to be brave to have the support and the nurturing that they deserve. So thank you for all being here tonight and I am looking forward to our panel. Thank you, Carl, for your important message. And uh, so I'm now going to introduce our fantastic panelists who've been waiting in the wings. So come on through. So, to my immediate left is Ellen Barry, who's had an amazing career at the New York Times. She is their mental health correspondent and was previously bureau chief in Moscow and Delhi and chief international correspondent. I can't think of a better person to chair our discussion. Raya Rage is equally remarkable. She is a senior crisis advisor at Amnesty International in New York, investigating war crimes and human rights abuses in countries like Syria, Yemen, South Sudan, and Myanmar. And before that, she was a journalist for 15 years covering the Middle East and Africa for the Associated Press and Al Jazeera English. She's also a mentor for our sister organization in London, training Middle Eastern journalists. That's the Marie Colvin Network. And we're very honored as well to have Dr. Anissa Avidagam here. She is the Sunni Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health at Stony Brook. She was also a medical student in Beirut during the Lebanese Civil War and brings a great deal of personal insight to the subject. But first, we've got one other thing in store. We're gonna kick off our discussion with a special message from Richard Engel, 
NBC's chief international correspondent, which he filmed for us from Ukraine, where so many journalists are reporting with such courage and bravery now. And then we'll go straight into the talk. There'll be questions from the floor at the end. Thanks so much. Marie was my friend. I respected her, I admired her. And when you live as close to the edge as she did and take that many chances and push yourself that far, you are bound to get what used to be called PTSD. That was the catch-all phrase for it, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, now they call it PTS. They drop the disorder, except in some cases. And I actually think it's a, it's a good distinction because you always get PTS, post-traumatic stress when something stressful happens to you. But you only get the disorder when that post-traumatic stress is unmanageable, when it pulls you under, when it becomes such a weight that you can no longer keep moving forward. And with journalism, uh, particularly the kind of frontline journalism that Marie did, that, that her colleagues are, are still doing, it's different than uh, post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic stress disorder for other people who would normally encounter high stress environments. Think doctors, soldiers, ER medics, um, or, or victims of, of crimes. Each one is different. And for, and for journalism, there is a, a particularly subtle difference, a, a, a dangerous uh, factor that comes into play that, that doesn't happen with, with other professions. So if you imagine, uh, take the obvious, the easiest one, uh, a, a victim, someone who is at home and their home is, is raided and, and they're something terrible happens to them, uh, or a woman who's raped, or some, something atrocious happens to an innocent person that is shocking and appalling. They, can, they certainly have post-traumatic stress and can have post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, a soldier, uh, a soldier goes into to battle uh, time after time and, and, and does things that he's both proud of and, and perhaps uh, ashamed of afterwards or, or conflicted about, they're going to have post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic stress disorder. But in either of those cases, there's not really an element of free choice. Uh, the soldier, he's on that mission, and yes, he, he may have volunteered for, the, for military service, but the mission is underway. There's no time to think. You're there. You're in it. You're in the moment, and, and you, you, you finish the mission because there are other people around you relying on you and pushing you forward, and then you have time to think about it afterwards. With the victim of a crime, obviously, this was not something that that a victim had planned for and they were suddenly uh, assaulted in some way and, and then their, the life that they, they knew is, is somehow uh, uh, fractured or damaged. But with, a, with journalism, you can control, you have the ability to push yourself deeper and deeper into a, a, a dangerous place. Some people think all war reporting is the same. It, it's not. Even if you go to the front line or you go to a dangerous place, you can push yourself further than you have to. There are degrees, uh, and, and it's, it's, very, it's very subjective. But let's say I'm going to a frontline area. Do I go just far enough to get what I need for a particular story, that the evening news that night? Do I push it a little further to get something that I don't know what I'm going to find? But the further I go, the more danger there is, the more chance of catching a moment that's real and authentic. Do I go further than that? How far do I keep going? And uh, Marie pushed it pretty far. I saw her out in places where she was on the, uh, on the, on the, on the outer limit sometimes, and I've pushed it sometimes as well. And there is no real sort of set pattern to it. Sometimes when you're out there, you feel you don't need to go as far, and then other times you go a little bit further. So when you have this post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic stress syndrome, it is something of your own making. And that is a very different experience. And how deep you go to a degree is up to you. And uh, the reason people do it, the reason journalists do that, is once you've gone to that place, once you've seen behind the curtain, once you've seen what society looks like, once it has collapsed and the rules and laws have faded away, it is very hard to see anything else in the same light. Once you've seen something that bright, everything else fades in comparison. So to, to get that kind of truth, people are willing to go quite far and push themselves far. 
And that all comes at a cost. It's been 23 days since Evan Gershkovich was arrested in Yekaterinburg. It still makes me feel sick and disoriented. And the, the reason is because I know why he thought it was safe. He and I were part of a big group of young Americans who went to Russia in our 20s, um, fell in love with the country, made friendships, sometimes built families. And we worked there as journalists, thinking that we kind of knew what the rules were, that there was an organized structure of expectations. And this is the way it worked. When you were there doing your work, you were an irritant to the system. You, you were there, you were viewed as an agent of an adversary. Um, parts of the government would never be dissuaded um, that you were actually spies undercover. Um, sometimes when you did something that provoked them, the system would come and tap you on the shoulder. Um, and this is the way it would look. You would get called into the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and they would give you a talking to. Sometimes you would lose visa privileges. Sometimes the visas were slow. Sometimes they didn't come at all. And sometimes the system would inform you that it was in your space in a, in a way that was quite could be quite menacing. So something that would happen would be if you wrote something that was, that was threatening in some way, um, someone would come into your apartment, leave the windows open, move things around, take a dump in your toilet, just to let you know that they knew exactly what your daily habits were, what, what the spaces were that you and your family lived in. What is remarkable about this is that within those boundaries, it was possible to get quite a lot of work done. It was possible to have a career. Um, and, and that this was true not only since the fall of the Soviet Union, but through much of the Soviet period, that, there, that foreigners that foreigners were able to get a lot done within those limitations. I remember going to Gleb Pavlovsky, who was an old spin doctor for the Kremlin in 2012, when things started happening that broke these predictable patterns. And, and I asked him to tell me why I was seeing things I hadn't seen before. And he said, the system is informing us that the rules have changed. Um, and, and this is why Evan's arrest matters so much, because I think there aren't any rules anymore. And I don't know when it's going to be safe again um, to do work in, in Russia. And, and, and that is just a, it is, if that's true, it's, it's, a, it's a deeply disturbing. Um, and I, I want to ask our panelists, I'm talking about one country, but people like us are working all over the world. And I wonder whether we are just in a time period where the rule books are being thrown out, that those structures that allow us to do work safely with predictable expectations, whether they are collapsing. I think that those systems have started changing quite a while back. I mean, obviously, you, you refer to a very specific case that's happening now where um, even within the parameters of working in an oppressive environment, you could still work, but now it's, it's gone a step further. But if you, if you take a look from my experience, for example, um, when I look back at my career, which, which started in the aftermath of 9-11, of, of 
the big moment was was the Iraq War, right? And, and, and at the time, it was considered initially sort of a conventional warfare um, setting, right? And and then you, once you started having um, armed groups um, and urban warfare, and, and we're seeing more and more of the urban warfare settings in different parts of of the world, and and you hear you hear about it a lot in places where uh, war crimes documentation is happening. The challenges in that settings and how that changes the rules for everybody operating in, in different hostile environments. So the urban warfare setting, the actors that are involved in wars, uh, where it's not state on state, but it's armed groups and different types of armed groups within armed groups. So you started seeing these rules changing, I, I would argue, probably from the time of the Iraq war, at a certain point in the Iraq war, um, going into places um, or leading up to settings like the aftermath of the Arab uprising. So take, for example, Syria. Hmm. Um, initially, there was also a landscape which was very challenging, but journalists were able to operate. As the, as the conflict progressed, as first the uprising, then the conflict, then the stages of the conflict progressed, you, you started seeing the landscape and the rules all getting thrown out. What happened to Marie changed the rules. Hmm. Journalists didn't go the way they were doing, you know, how they were going when they started going through opposition-held areas or crossing the border illegally. F flash forward 2014, the rise of ISIS, again, completely thrown out all of the rules. What happened to James Foley in Sotlov again changes the rules. You start seeing newsrooms operating differently in their interactions with um, freelance journalists and how they hire them. So it, it has been quite a changing and evolving, I would argue, um, landscape over the past 20 years now. And it's mind boggling to say 20 years and to realize that it's been 20 years since the Iraq war. Um, and all of the conventional systems of covering warfare and hostile environments have been so rapidly changing such that different folks who are operating in these environments, whether they're journalists, human rights researchers, or humanitarian actors have had to adapt um, uh, how they access information, the risks they're willing to take, the mitigation um, processes in place, um, and then even developing new methodologies altogether when they can no longer be on the ground and have to do remote reporting and remote research. I wonder if you think that this is this means that big parts of the globe are are going dark, are are becoming impenetrable to to journalists. I mean, certainly that is the effort by governments <laughs> who are trying to, um, you know, oppress the, the flow of certain governments, not mm. all governments, obviously. We're trying to oppress the flow of information um, and, and the coverage uh, and the documentation in certain, in certain places. That said, I would argue that what we have seen in newsrooms and in human rights organizations um, is all sorts of innovative measures to try to circumvent that or mitigate or... Um, go around those kind of limitations, which is what I sort of briefly alluded to in my previous answer, remote research. So for example, in a country like Syria, um, you know, at Amnesty International, at Human Rights Watch, for years now, the authorities would not give us access to certain areas under their control. Um, that does not mean that, and it's not just in human rights organizations, but also in newsrooms, that does not mean that, you know, folks are going to throw their hands up in the air and decide to not cover, um, they just then develop new methodologies, which is using social media apps uh, to interview um, survivors and witnesses remotely, and then using other tools to verify information re remotely, such as satellite imagery or video photo verification to, to corroborate as much as you can through multiple, sort of like a multidisciplinary approach to reporting and research uh, to overcome these attempts uh, to constantly change the landscape and ability to freely report and cover. We're, we're here to, to honor Marie Colvin um, tonight. And I think we're all probably thinking about, about her and um, the, the choices that she made in her life and the reasons for those choices. She knew that she was going to bear witness to horrible things, but I'm not sure she knew because I'm not sure any of us understood that when we do this, it changes us as well. Um, 
the science on that has, has expanded enormously during my career. And Anissa, I wonder if you could explain a little bit what we know about what this kind of work does to a person. Yeah. I mean, so in general, stress by itself affects us, affects the brain, and through the brain affects the body as a whole. And so here we're, we're dealing with extreme stress, you know, to the point of like traumatic events. But any degree of stress that is happening as on a regular basis that has really a uh, kind of a painful connotation that is repeated is going to affect us. And the more of it, the more painful it, it's going to be, uh, has, it's going to have more consequences. So I thought I would talk a little bit about what happens in the brain and in the body when people are exposed to this kind of stress. And if I could have the first slide, I'm going to just promise only two slides <laughs> because it's easier to see things. I'm not going to go into a... You know, um, if I could have the first slide, please. Okay, so <clears throat> you're seeing here a brain regions uh, that show the systems and the, the circuits that modulate our um, recording of stress and our response to stress. The main region is the amygdala, which is this uh, kind of small region tucked into deep into the brain. It's represented in red. And it's controlled, modulated by two other brain regions that are important, the prefrontal cortex, which is in blue, and the hippocampus, which is in green. Those regions are trying to kind of uh, dim down the response of the amygdala to stress. If this modulation doesn't occur properly, the amygdala is going to be overactive. And this kind of overactivation of the amygdala in the response to stress is going to send exaggerated signals outside of the amygdala to various parts of the, the brain that control various parts of our body so that it would result in an exaggerated effect to a response to stress that results in the post-traumatic stress symptoms or disorder. So what happens in the amygdala is that you know, it records um, inputs that are threatening. So, for example, being in a war zone, uh, hearing loud noises, uh, uh, being exposed to scary situations, as well as the context, so neutral events. And inside the amygdala is this kind of integration of these two. And there is a phenomenon that happens that's called fear conditioning. So that the fear spreads from the fearful event to the neutral event, and we call this fear conditioning, so that things that are neutral becomes kind of scary, and that's how people can react, for example, to loud noises while there is no threat. That's because that's been associated at some point to a scary um, stimulus. Uh, if I may have the second slide. So from this circuitry of the medial prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus kind of... Um, talking with the amygdala, and then the response of the amygdala is going to be transmitted. So that is the fear response to many parts of the body, and, uh, and that's going to manifest with, for example, effects on the heart rate, blood pressure, stomach motility, uh, skin conductance, um, cortisol levels, uh, startle response, and all of that is going to be exaggerated when people are in a stressful situation. And so this is really kind of at the basis of what happens in the brain that's transmitted in the body that can result in the symptoms that Mary has experienced. I mean, I, I think we've, we've all been thinking and talking about how to envision a, a journalism that um, both protects our workers who we send out into these incredibly powerful, intense, and frightening situations, and also gives them the opportunity to work. And, and I guess I, I would ask both of you, um, what can employers do, whether it's police departments, hospitals, ambulance services, or newsrooms, do to make this work more safe? Given, given that it is on a baseline, exposing yourself repeatedly 
to this kind of very extreme stimulus. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would say that these kind of uh, work environments need to have the structure to allow people to debrief. Mm -hmm. uh, and that structure, you know, is kind of related to ensuring wellness. Uh, it could be as extensive as feasible. So places where people can come in and talk about what they experience. Because the first uh, most therapeutic um, thing that could happen is to recognize that the event was traumatic and to be able to talk about it. Uh, there is actually, after the, re the stress response and the fear response is kind of, um, uh, you know, ingrained, there's a process of e extinction that could happen that is therapeutic. Sometimes it happens on its own, but when it doesn't happen on its own, a therapy can help with that. And the therapy is to try to make someone re-experience the threat, but in a safe environment. And over time, repeatedly, so it kind of loses its threatening nature. It becomes kind of like routine or boring. And so to provide environments where that can be done through either therapy and talk therapy and even provide medications, deal with it, basically help people overcome the very normal reaction that they're having, whether it's limited or it's more extensive, pathological, there are degrees of interventions that need to happen. There's no way I'm going to be anywhere near as eloquent. <laughs> that was really incredible and, and such incredibly useful um, answer and proposal. I guess the way I, my, my mind was thinking when, when you asked that question is there are two sets of things. There's the operational side of um, safety for you and who you're working with and what the mitigation measures that have to do with that and ensuring that maybe perhaps you don't get to the point where you get to a situation, although you know, you could mitigate as much as you can. So there's the operational aspect of things. And then there's the mental health response and, and the management of things. And I don't know where to begin, but if I would begin with the operational aspect, I, I think that, again, the changing environment uh, and rules and landscape that we address in your, in your aptly put first question have then led to um, changing operations in newsrooms where in my, for example, 15 year career in journalism prior to, to transition, you know, my seven year transition into human rights, I saw a, conversations happen in the recent years or the last years of my journalism years that didn't happen earlier. So in, 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 in trips to hostile environments toward the end of my journalism career, you started seeing things such as risk assessment forms, which by the way are integral procedure now in my job at Amnesty. I don't go anywhere without filling uh, anywhere, you know, that there are countries where they classify the risks medium high for different reasons, uh, but we don't travel anywhere without filling out a risk assessment form that would assess the risk to myself, to the folks I'm interviewing, to anyone I'm working with, whether it's a driver or a local consultant or an interpreter. And that is, that is very important. And it is it goes to trying to put mitigation measures in place that try as much as possible to avert getting to a situation where things could go bad. That said, even with you know, risk assessment forms and mitigations, that does not necessarily address the exposure to certain traumatic interviews or you know, secondary trauma or difficult situations. So just saying that that risk assessment um, or that operational measure is very important and newsrooms have started recognizing it in recent years. Certainly human rights organizations have been as well. On the mental health response, as, as Dr. Adisa pointed out, I mean, there has to be a space where conversations take place. And again, we've only seen that happen in the aftermath of the Iraq war when there have been such publicly visible cases of uh, journalists struggling very publicly. And, and it, that's really what put that conversation of post-traumatic post -traumatic stress in newsrooms on the agenda. It took years for us to even get to the point, to the comfort level to have these conversations, mm -hmm. but it was the Iraq war that brought it to attention. And just to, 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 to briefly wrap it up, even with all of that, the, the managers, the management, I think in a lot of newsrooms, most likely continue to pay lip service to that rather than actually putting in place measures that, that need to be put in place. I, I feel like where this kind of the rubber hits the road on this question, if you are 
a manager of a newsroom and you have a, a shining star, a, an incredible journalist who has a history of PTSD, who has been treated for PTSD and wants to go back out, how does that information affect your decision making? Does it make you more likely to send them, less likely to send them, or can you somehow be neutral to the history of this individual? Well, yeah, this is important information, and uh, obviously it's significant and it should be taken into account. Um, I would balance this in terms of the severity of the symptoms, the ability of access to help if needed, to treatment, versus you know the, the free will of this individual to go back and do the work that they want to do. I wouldn't necessarily prevent that from happening, and I wouldn't take measures to forbid someone with a history of PTSD from doing the work they want to do. That's kind of what I, my, my approach would be. Uh, it could be wrong, but um, I strongly believe in free will, and as long as there are safeguards, I think it's okay. Yeah, I mean, it's entirely based on informed consent and, and to, to exclude people based on a mental health condition from a human rights perspective, even purely from, you know, human rights standards would be an exclusionary measure that that I don't I don't I personally would not be advocating for. And, and, and as Dr. Anissa pointed out, it's entirely I mean, it, it, there has to be a way where there's a balance. But but on that point, Alan, what I, I mean, I could I could speak from personal experience where <clears throat> There are certain aspects of being exposed to traumatic experiences that are then extremely compounded by the way management handles it. Mm -hmm. and, and I've certainly experienced that as a journalist and certainly been told that the level of uh, or the outcome that I had been experiencing was entirely magnified because of the way you know, a, 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 the management handled the situation. What kind of management response are you talking about? Um, how managers... Um, dismissive? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a combination of things. It's, it's not just necessarily dismissive, but also the kind of load they put, you, they put on mm -hmm. you or the positions they put you in or even merely um, the courtesy, the feedback, the kind words. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it ranges really from a lot of things, from from um, more proactive to to less to, to negative. You know, you know, to the other way around. And there's there's just the, the way that managers respond to um, a journalist being in a difficult situation, from ranging from assigning them or responding to them to even regular responses, not necessarily responses to them being open about an experience or a mm. traumatic experience completely affects the extent to which they then are able to handle their distress and the magnitude of their distress. Um, secondly, again, speaking from personal experience, uh, where I had experienced a particular situation, uh, an, an, an extremely difficult situation, where I was then called back to headquarters and asked to undertake an assessment hmm. uh, in order to determine whether it was okay for me to go out again hmm. uh, to the field. You could look at it many ways. You could look at it in, a, you know, some could argue that management was being responsible. Some could argue that that was a very heavy handed way. Some could argue that they were doing it out of, uh, a con out of concern. And it was not something that was ever made public. It was entirely dealt with in, in, in privacy. But uh, those are some, some examples where opinions can really die, die, you know, there's a divergence on opinions on whether, you know, it was heavy handed or whether. But what did you think? Um, I oscillated. Yeah. I oscillated. I, I appreciated the effort. Right. I appreciated the effort. Naturally, I was concerned about whether it would uh, then disabled me from continue to right. do the work that right. I want to do. So of course I had extreme concerns about it. Um, also, I had concerns about the confidentiality of my, of right? And, and any, any company required assessment, 
yeah. even, you know, you, you, even with all the Hippocratic oaths and, you know, promises or vows by a mental health professional, if he is still being contracted by your organization, mm -hmm. there's definitely a question there about confidentiality. But all of these interventions require front-loading services. That is like offering services to people who have not asked them. And I, I think that this is challenging. It's a challenging moment. And it, and it would be for me as well to decide how much to engage, you know, and how much do you trust your organization um, to, be, to be completely vulnerable with them about your mental health? I, yeah, I guess I, I would be interested to know, like, for example, at the New York Times, do you have availability of professional help that is... Um, confidential, discreet, that you can tap into if needed. Something like that would make it I think, mundane and acceptable. And So this has changed a great deal in the last few years. And I, 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 I guess I would characterize, I'm no longer in doing conflict reporting, um, but, but I think what they do is they offer services regularly. Um, I, think, I think there's a lot more prophylactic mm. kind of intervention. Um, but whether that means that you have to have a high degree of trust to engage um, when you're really having a problem, you have to believe that your career is not going to be affected by it. And I think that's still a barrier that's up um, if, if you're in the middle of having a problem. Ray, I want to. And that's sorry, yeah. not, to, not to interrupt, yeah. but that's exactly also where I go back to the point of the level of management and approach and the level of trust that they're able to create if there is the right approach from them. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, different types of management styles vary, but I, I would argue that you could have a manager who is more comforting or that you could, and we've all worked with managers that we were able to trust and right. managers we weren't able to trust. And, and that influences then our ability to uh, have faith in these services or not, right? I, I would argue. I mean, I just think it's going to be a huge structural challenge, right. not just for yeah. this profession, but for it's... many professions going forward as, as we begin to <laughs> yeah. see these injuries that were invisible to us previously. Um, yes, we have I mean, disability I'm... systems that are all built for physical injury, um, and they are legalistic systems, they are adversarial systems. How are they going to work for mental injury? Um, I mean, they work in other fields, um, you know, all, all professions have built in, so for example, in colleges, they have student services and students can access those services for mental health and they're confidential and they don't result in discrimination against a student. I would say that those kind of system have been built in into other uh, spaces and professions hmm. and one can look at that as an example to follow but it should i mean at MST, we be... have something like that we have a call-in like a service it's a third party that they yeah, that they hired outside. entirely yeah. outside that you call in yeah. and they offer you know 10 or 12 sessions a year um obviously subject to extension should the case need where you could reach out for counseling after a trip before a trip even how to prepare yourself or you know, build up resilience ahead of a trip. I think there just needs to be the recognition for the need for it. And then the feasibility is not that difficult. Well, I want to ask you a little bit about the work you do for Amnesty. As a, as a journalist, there's nothing more morally exhausting than working in a refugee camp and asking a long line of people to tell you about the worst thing that ever happened to them. And I think most journalists have had this experience and it leaves you, um, it is an incredibly draining thing to, to spend a day doing. And journalists get enough narratives for an article, but people who do what you do, um, you are collecting forensic information and the volume of testimony that you have to gather I, it really sort of, I just want to ask you what that's like. So you hit the nail on the head right there, right? And when I, when I did the transition from, from journalism to this job, I initially assumed, okay, it's based on the same skill set. I'm interviewing people. I'm hearing, I'm telling their stories. How different can it be? Mm. I, I underestimated the aspect of the volume, which is really the key word here. It is, what I do is in bulk. 
mm. because we are trying to identify patterns of violations. So in, it's not that you are interviewed. I mean, think of the best article you've read where, you know, how many people are interviewed? 10, 15, 20? In a human rights report, we're talking about dozens. Sometimes we put, I've, I've worked on reports where we've interviewed 170, 130, 90 people. And you sit there and you listen to the testimony during the interview. And those interviews are very different than the kind of interviews that I did as a journalist. So first of all, there's a very structured, informed consent process. We go, there is, everything is very trauma-informed in this work, mm -hmm. which I appreciated a lot. And it's a kind of training that I didn't have when I was a journalist. And now you're seeing very recently, long after I've left journalism, this transitioning into some newsrooms where this trauma-informed reporting um, approach is, is, is growing. But that is very much the methodology of human rights organizations where you sit and you talk to a survivor, tell them how the who you are, how the information is going to be used, that they can stop at any time, that they could take a break. That they So it's a very different approach to interviewing mm -hmm. than when I was a journalist. Um, and then the interviews are lengthy, right? It's not like a quick, because I'm not after a quick quote, right? right. These testimonies. I mean, I, I remember my very first Amnesty International report. It was in the Philippines and it was to document violations in relation to the so-called war on drugs. And I remember looking up to my colleague and saying, oh, wow, we've been interviewing this woman for an hour and 45 minutes. I didn't have to look at my watch. I didn't have to rush to do a live shot. I don't have to worry about my hair. Hmm. I don't have to worry about a deadline that's happening right now. It's, I'm not disparaging journalism at all. <laughs> I, I absolutely, I absolutely not. I'm at core in my heart a journalist. I'm just saying it's a different beast. And just the level of comfort I felt sitting in that interview and not having to rush was extremely dif different. Hmm. But like you said, it's that interview and then 70 other interviews like it. And, and, and you sit and you hear it in the, in the interview, then when you're transcribing, then when you're writing, and then in the review process, which can at times take, takes months. But it's a very, very different trauma-informed approach to work. Than, than, than what I did before. I don't know if that answers your question. I feel like there were multiple layers to it. I mean, I think one of the most difficult things about interviewing people about war crimes or atrocities is that you are looking for accounts that can be corroborated. And often, if you're sitting there listening to five or 10 people telling you about a rape and you are thinking, what can I, which of these stories can be used in a sort of semi-legalistic, there's, there's something very strange about listening to people's, the worst thing that ever happened to them with an eye towards what, what will hold up. So it's drilled into us and in, drilled in, as, as human rights investigators in, in, in this trauma-informed approach that you, the, the survivor truly is the center of this testimony mm -hmm. and you don't ever approach it with a hubris of is this person lying is mm -hmm. this person? obviously I'm not in the business of putting out misinformation right which is exactly why we interview dozens upon dozens of people because in interviewing dozens upon dozens of people that's where the patterns of violation become clear and you're able to say with authority that something is indeed happening the way it's happening because it's happening that way to multiple people and and you're able to build that pattern. But you never approach the interview with the hubris of, because understanding what trauma does to a person is core here. And trauma manifest, and I'm not a doctor here, Dr. Lisa can speak better to that, but trauma can manifest itself in many ways. And so the assumption that somebody might look composed or might be lying or might not, you know, like I'm not, that, that's not how we approach the interviews. What we try to, and, and, and also on that note, you have to really understand, and I'm sure you, you from your experience, you know that, that in interviewing survivors of, 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 of traumatic events, the notion that you're going to get a coherent testimony mm -hmm. is very rare, right? Like people's recollections could be all over the place. Things could be misremembered. A lot of things are not in order. And it's not at all my place to, to walk in with a judgment. That said, yes, I try to verify multiple ways through, again, interviewing more and more people. So then I could hear that there's a pattern and that pattern indeed exists. Um, at times, people have medical records. At times, there are photos of their injuries, which we then share with medical experts and forensic experts. At times, we use satellite imagery where that 
is possible in a particular case to verify a violation. And like I said, videos and photos, like, you know, for example, witnesses to a certain attack, um, uh, or an airstrike or, you know, a mortar attack, I, I would always try to also get mm. photos of the aftermath to share it with weapons experts and satellite imagery experts to try to add a layer of corroboration. But, but all to say that I understand what you're saying about the difficulty of listening to it. Um, but I guess the, the, the approach is to not come from a place of assumption that someone is, is, is lying and to respect that, that trauma-informed lens. Anissa, I wonder if I could ask you a little, you, when you were young, you lived in the middle of a, of a war zone. And now we have this whole language for PTSD and trauma and treatment for these things. But, but then you didn't have that language. So when you look back at, at that time in your life, what were you seeing that's, that's useful that, that you learned from? Um, yeah, so, you know, I uh, grew up in Beirut and the civil war started somewhere my, during my adolescence. So I spent most of my adolescence, early adulthood in a civil war situation. And um, it really kind of changes you at many levels. And you obviously, I mean, at, you don't have words for it and you don't know what is happening. One thing that struck me when I was uh, listening to the video is the description of the reporter going back into the war zone and in a way not being able to stay back, to just kind of keep going. And, you know, it reminded me of the kind of uh, stage where you get where um, it almost like doesn't matter anymore. You're almost like you're in a, this, I think that for reporters, they may get into a kind of a, um, an over, um, a, 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 a kind of a flight um, fight or flight stage, hmm. where you're just kind of dealing with the acute stress, but then was over time, you're desensitized to the danger, hmm. and you're almost playing game with the danger, you're just trying to um, uh, undo it. So I remember going, for example, on a regular basis in um, streets to go to the hospital where I was doing my training, where there were these um, snipers, you know, a frontier in French. So snipers, the people who are like just kind of hunting people as they cross. And I would just feel so proud any time that I just crossed and didn't get a sniper shot. I mean, obviously I didn't get the sniper shot because I survived, but it almost becomes like this game with death. You're just kind of playing. Who's gonna win here? You because think you, you were don't... desensitized. Um, you, you, you kind of become defiant in a way. Hmm. You, you know, you are not gonna control my life. If I have to go now where I need to go, I'm going to go. And, and there is this kind of zone where you're in, which is just not normal. It's not really, it's kind of a, almost a pathological stage. It's not strictly PTSD. It's a multitude of things. Uh, and I think it's like the coping mechanisms that everybody develops in their own way. So the way you dealt with hearing horror stories, I mean, dealing with just living with this kind of challenge to your daily life on a regular basis. Um, there are all kinds of things that happen that you don't really necessarily have words for. I mean, now I would say, well, that was semi-suicidal. I mean, was I suicidal? <laughs> Obviously, I didn't have that word in mind, and that's not what I was doing. I was just going to work. Uh, so um, having the terminology, I mean, is always helpful. Knowing what's happening is like the first step to kind of... Um, dealing with it and recovering. I do retain a super startle response as mm -hmm. my partner here <laughs> noticed. <laughs> so I jump to noises. I kind of react strongly if somebody suddenly shows up, which is really bizarre when you're just in a very safe you know, environment at home. Mm -hmm. uh, so it just kind of stays with you for- Do you um, think that's time. with you to the end of your life? Well, I mean, it's been many decades, I'm old. So yeah, it will probably be there, <laughs> yeah. There's something that I hear all the time about war correspondence. I wanna sort of ask you both why this is true, which is, um, which is when they're on assignment, they get a kind of superhuman focus 
And then when they're home and relaxed, they literally can't find their way to the grocery store. Um, and, and just the assignment is a clarifying, focusing power. So, so what's that about? So this is what I was saying, the, the fight or flight response, this noradrenaline surge. You know, all the transmitters are kind of like in super drive. You're on alert. You're really like focused on what you need to do to survive or to get your work done, whatever it is. And then, you know, it's afterwards when you let your guards down that you have the post kind of like the, the effects of having been in this uh, situation. And, you know, one of the symptoms of PTSD is lack of, is, is cognitive deficits. You know, concentration is uh, uh, impaired, attention is impaired, thinking. So, I mean, it's possible that it's contributing to being in a wild loss, in addition to the mood component, feeling anxious, uh, uh, depressed, feeling down, feeling, you know, it's like the, the deflated feeling on you know, from having been in something as, in a way, as intense, as important. Uh, you know, there are all aspects to that. So it's not only the stress, but also the importance of the mission. I don't know what to tell you, Ellen. I'm wired all the time. <laughs> <laughs> in the field or back at home, it's just I have one mode. Um, but no, jo jokes aside, I think, I think that's a very eloquent way of, of saying it, and there's no way that I could add to that. But I, I do want to... Um, to take it some, somewhere a, a bit different, uh, which is, yes, there, there is the experience of, of uh, for some people, there is an element of becoming desensitized to, to, to that. I always, my personal experience had been that if I ever felt that way, then that's the time to stop. Uh, I always get asked, um, friends, family, colleagues sometimes would ask, oh, are you... Are you not afraid? Of course I am afraid, I would say, because if I'm not afraid, that's a problem. If I'm walking willingly into a war zone mm. and I'm not afraid, I would argue you would need to stop and ask yourself some serious questions. Um, different people have different styles. For me, if I'm not doing that, then I won't have my guard up. I won't have the, again, that's not to say that if anything happens, that then I'm responsible, or that where people have lost their lives and done incredible work, and that that's not to say that they weren't. I'm, I'm not judging anyone's experience. I'm saying some people, yes, are desensitized, but I, I think that some people still retain a level of recognition, no matter how many times they've done this, mm -hmm. no matter how many war zones they've been, that I am walking into a hostile environment. Did you ever have that feeling that you that you had lost your, uh, I guess, smoke detector? No, because like I said, I always thought if I did, you then were looking it's time, for it. If if I do, then it's time to quit. Hmm. So I want to open open this up to questions. We have lots of interesting people in the audience, so uh, please come at us. We ha we have mics on both sides here. Hello, my name is Christine Kelly. Um, so those of us who say, you know, either have PTSD or are intensely familiar with, um, with it, know to say that it's often a subconscious language, just a set of, you know, experiences and symptoms that you fall into years to, we know how, how that works. Um, let's say like for people who aren't familiar with it for how that works so much, say, how do we communicate you know, that to them? Or say, on the flip side, what should our colleagues who don't have those traumatic experiences look out for? So how, you're asking how to help people who may have these symptoms but don't recognize them? Yeah, say, or at least to like recognize them, but like, let's say, how do they, say, communicate this to people that don't have those experiences and oh, on the flip to describe side, yeah. your experience to somebody who hasn't lived through that. Yeah. Um, I think, um, you know, it's uh, just being honest and um, telling them, I guess it depends what you're trying to achieve. Um, you're, tr you're, you're saying to describe to somebody who hasn't lived in a trauma, what is it like to be in that setting? Uh, because you want them 
to understand what, what the symptoms are and how. Um, it's hard to imagine what, and you don't want to kind of be very graphic in a way, but uh, I think that being transparent is necessary to be able to explain what you've been, what you know, one has been through and what are the consequences. Yeah, I don't know if that. I wanted to ask, as you discussed just before, um, is it a myth of the person that rushes to the uh, action, the, to the uh, dangerous environment? Uh, is, is that just a, a myth of uh, popular literature and stuff? I don't think so. I mean, I mean I do think... you know people, I'm sure you've encountered, it, as I have in my own professional life, of people that rushes to the to the yes. excitement, to the uh, thrill, I mean, part of it danger. is these are, these are distressing world events, and, and sometimes going to work is the best way to cope with them. Do you know what I mean? So 9-11, we both went to work and probably worked for, you know, the next four months without stopping. It's in a strange way, it's a way of processing calamity mm -hmm. to start working in this mode where you know what you're supposed to be doing. I was wondering about more of the, like, like a common thread in a lot of popular culture. Uh, well, some people of, are... of the person that's, you know, the, the, uh, the addict to the uh, thrill. Yeah, some people are more risk-taking than others. You know, you have the whole spectrum. Some people want to avoid risk at any cost, and some people just jump into any risky situation. And you have the whole spe spectrum in between. And you know why the risk taking? Uh, I mean, yes, maybe it's the thrill of the adventure, the thrill of the fear, the thrill of um, surviving. Of, you know, it, there's all kinds of. Uh, but is it a neurological would, thing? Uh, we, we, chemical? Probably, yeah. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say that we know exactly how it works, but um, um, there are there's impulsivity, there's. Um, you know, probably some brain regions that aren't as kind of uh, modulated as they should be. <laughs> and the only question, the only other thought I had was, do they also, those risk takers experience the PTSD also? Well, that's a good question. I don't know that anybody's looked at that. There are personalities and there are types of issues that predisposes some people to develop PTSD more so than others. Uh, for example, be, you know, female sex is... Um, you know, it's much more prevalent to have PTSD for women than men. Some genetic type of, um, you know, some genes predispose people to have PTSD more than others. Um, you know, how bad the experience was, how repeated it was, how the history. So there are factors that can uh, predispose people to, more, to have more likely PTSD. If I just may point out quickly on that point that... Um... And, and this, this is not at all in a scientific response, but um, there is an over-glorification or an issue of representation in, in the media of so-called, you know, even the term war correspondence, by the way, a lot of journalists who do it really detest that language, right? It's, it's the, and the more derogatory way of referring to it is adrenaline junkie, right? I promise you that probably nine times out of 10 where I've worked with colleagues who do this job, they're, they're, not, they're not in it for the thrill. There's obviously, we all have colleagues and we all have seen colleagues who have that element and who have that um, pension for that kind of environment. But I don't, I don't necessarily, I'm not, I'm not just me, but a lot of people I know, we're not doing it for the thrill. And, there, and the problem is that the way it is portrayed often in the media, I mean, I can't tell you every time I turn on a Netflix show and I cringe about like, oh, I want to go to Iraq is I want to be a war. I mean, it's just the framing is so exaggerated is, is what I'm trying to say. I also think it's very hard if you've interacted with populations in conflict zones to walk away from those, to go home where it's safe and not be a little stuck with the people you remember, the people you left behind in danger when you left for safety. I, I think for a lot of people who do this work, that's one of the reasons to go back. Um, I, wanna, I wanna thank everyone. First of all, I, I've spoken to my sister many times about these issues and really um, appreciate all of your insightful 
um, thoughts on it. I uh, recently spoke to a war correspondent who experienced something um, that Roya mentioned about remote reporting. Um, she's someone who'd spent many years in war zones, and then because of the extreme danger of reporting from a certain area, she was reporting through the videos that were coming mm -hmm. out from local journalists and citizen journalists. Um, and it was really interesting that she found that to be a lot more difficult, sitting in a room and watching horrible scene after horrible scene, whereas when she was you know, in a war zone physically, she could do what Richard Engel was mentioning and kind of step back or um, keep a, a distance that she was comfortable with. So I, I just wondered, Dr. Lissa, what that impact has of that remote reporting um, compared to being really on the ground. I thought that was really interesting. Um, yes, I think that when you're on the ground, you have the possibility of sharing emotions with people of experiencing the grief. While when you're remote, you're, it's just you, and you know you have no one to really share this. To, and I, you know, I, I mean, this is more, not as much as a professional as it is a personal um, also observation. So I was in the US, for example, when the big blast happened in Beirut. And just not being there with my friends and family and being able to just see firsthand what's going on, it, it just takes away a little bit in a way. It doesn't allow you to grieve the way you, wanna, you want to or the way it would be helpful for you to kind of process the, the situation. I mean, you're safe, but at the same time, you wish you were with your people in a way. And I think maybe some of that happens when, when you're just kind of um, reviewing all this and not being able to share the emotional burden with someone. And do you think it has a post-traumatic post-traumatic stress associated with that remote reporting or a different kind of impact? It, there are really, there is no data. You know, I, I don't know. It hasn't been really reported, uh, which doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Yeah, thank you. My goodness, the eloquence. I'm just floored by your answer. <laughs> just absolutely, absolutely floored by your answer. But if I may pick up on that answer, because I'm very glad you asked that question because it was actually part of a conversation I was having with Ellen earlier. Um, so when I'm, I'm, I, I should have mentioned that earlier when I mentioned those methodologies, but I was trying to not rant for too long. But in actually part of developing these new methodologies of work and the remote work, again, the changing landscape and the changing environment, new challenges arose, which is that we very much see, um, and uh, whether human rights investigators were doing it remotely or video editors, folks in newsrooms who are cutting newscasts, um, then the whole new open source investigation field where people are watching videos and photos in bulk online and trying to verify them and trying to geolocate a certain location, that has a huge impact just as much as being in the field. Again, floored by the explanation why. Um, and we are seeing research now from human rights investigators about vicarious trauma. So it's being described as vicarious trauma, secondary trauma, different terms for it. And um, there's now a lot of guide, not a lot, a handful at least of guides that have been developed by newsrooms and by human rights uh, organizations and academics on how to deal with that. Tips, literally tip sheets, uh, tip, tip sheets, sorry, on how to, um, you know, take off the earpiece. You don't need to listen to all the video in your ear. Um, use um, uh, post-it notes to cover parts of the video if you have to watch it over and over again and you're expecting. Turn off autoplay in YouTube and Twitter. Like literally steps to guide uh, folks who are doing this kind of remote work to minimize their exposure to, to this vicarious trauma, which has just as much an impact as, as being in the field. So thanks so much for asking that important question. I do think there was a lot of research after 9-11 that looked at the impact of watching footage repeatedly. And I think that it is now pretty well established that that has a damaging effect. Well, so, I mean, watching the uh, footage is always used, not watching, but showing violence or showing uh, pictures that are aversive are used to elicit the stress response. Hmm. 
uh, in the brain. And that's done uh, on a routine basis in like fMRI studies to look mm -hmm. at activation of brain circuits. This is how some of the data that, I mean, some of the information I showed is elicited. There are studies in rodents, but there are studies in humans with imaging. But whether that has resulted in PTSD for mm -hmm. PTSD, right. as right. in, you know, probably, probably true, but I haven't seen um, statistics on it yet. But definitely being exposed even on video to um, these kind of imageries will, uh, will activate the brain circuits that um, underlie fear. Um, hi, um, I have a question. Um, first of all, great discussion. I think my question is, to what extent is the openness and vulnerability within the journalism field about mental health in general kind of in the, encourage others not in the field but going through the same mental health journey to be expressive when seeing such a demanding field, some, seeing such people in such a demanding field be, such, be so vulnerable? I mean, I actually think it really has changed. I think people, I think the, the stigma is, is dropping quite quickly in society where, where you would talk about therapy or getting, going on medication or seeking treatment with your colleagues I, in a way that wouldn't have been true 15 years ago. I don't know if you agree no, with absolutely. that. No, absolutely. I mean, we wouldn't have been having, that, that's what I alluded to earlier, right? Like the, the visibility that some of some particular known cases in the aftermath of the Iraq war, and it took 20 years for us. I mean, so the Iraq war was 20 years ago and people started really visibly struggling from going back and back and back. Mm -hmm. But it, look how many years it took for us to have this kind of space and openness, but it, it has changed for sure. And the, the openness and willingness has, has changed. Now, the stigma around it, yeah, I mean, has it gone completely? Probably not. But the, the, the willingness to have these conversations, which is, 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 as Dr. Anissa pointed out, the recognition in the first place, which is the very first step, is there. And then journalists are storytellers. They tell stories about the culture, and that's a powerful position to be in. So the more that coverage acknowledges mental health um, and, and like on any news story, and, and you just see it much more, you see, you see this at least, you see it said outright much more. With sports figures, with celebrities, it's not just journalists. The more people in the public eye speak about it, the, the better, the, the more transparency and openness and less awkwardness there is about something that is entirely natural and not awkward. But in a strange way, some of this is happening more on social media even than in traditional news outlets. So like the way people talk about their m sort of mental health treatment and diagnoses on TikTok is just un unreal. And that's an almost a generational attribute that, um, that people who are 20 years younger than us are very willing to share their diagnoses. So I just think we're, we're gonna see a big change in the society. Thank you. Hello, as someone who is like aspiring to be an international correspondent, I'm kind of really interested to hear um, your response on like what advice you would give to someone looking to be one, but also how you mentioned how to transition out of a war zone conflict, but how would you prepare for the transition into a war zone conflict? I'll briefly say it's, it's great to learn languages. You'll come in handy. Um, it's great to live in other countries so you can operate in unfamiliar settings just to logistically get things done because a lot of this work is about um, setting things up, like getting power, getting rides, places, getting communications. Um, so I think living abroad, li living in any foreign country is a really good preparation for that. That's really incredible advice. I don't know that I have much to add to it, but if you're asking about how to prepare yourself before walking into a particular hostile environment, um, it's all about the more you know, the better, play, the better you're able to put yourself in, in, the more you're able to put yourself in a better position. That said, obviously, uh, you can't, it's very rare that you're walking into a situation with a full set of facts. But the more you know, the better, and the less assumptions you make, the better. <laughs> it's a combination of both. Um, and you know, just the humility of 
you know, the, the respect to the local community, the, the cooperation with the local community, the, the, the less you act like you, and just recognizing that you are inserting yourself in an environment that is very much not necessarily yours um, is huge. And, and so, so many things that you need to recognize, and it just starts by being prepared and collecting information and speaking to people who have been there, um, speaking to people who are there, um, the more you know, the better, I guess, in, in a nutshell. There are so many details to it, but in a nutshell, I guess that would be it. OK, thank you. This is such a fascinating and phenomenal panel. Thank you. Um, this is a related question. So from the vantage point of a university that's educating journalists, the next generation of journalists, what do you think we should be doing in our educational practices to better prepare people? Um, and how might universities like ours help serve journalists in the field? Are there things we could be doing? I can answer that because I have two journalism degrees, none of which taught me the things that <laughs> that are relevant to this. Two journalism degrees. Not disparaging journalism schools, but nobody needs two journalism degrees. <laughs> I could <laughs> sorry for hijacking the question, but um, again, not disparaging journalism schools or, or, or academic environments, but there are things that we were not taught in school. In fact, we were not taught in newsrooms or trained in newsrooms. Uh, the the, the trauma-informed approach to interviewing, to operating, is really critical. Um, many news, many um, journalism institutions are recognizing that and recognizing the need for that. So that's why we see entire centers like the DART Center at Columbia University starting up. Well, for, for years now, um, operating uh, to try to, to fill that vacuum, which straddles two um, um, trajectories. One, um, better equipping journalists, give them better training, better practices um, uh, on how to operate in this environment so that they are more respectful of the folks they're interviewing and their experiences, and also self-care. Um, and how to uh, be mindful of that. So those are the two trajectories that you see, um, you know, places like the Dart Center um, advocating for, and then offering again guidance and tip sheets and best practices and stories. And then, an, you know, they even started awards to sh to, to highlight the types of journalism that um, crystallize exactly that kind of ethical approach. Now we've all taken, I mean, again, in the two journalism degrees that I've taken, I have, uh, that I've acquired, I have taken ethics classes. So we talk a lot about ethics, we talk a lot about law, but we really, at that time, maybe that has changed in recent years. Again, I'm not gonna say when was the last time I had a journalism degree, but um, I don't think that in those ethics classes there were conversations about uh, trauma-informed approach to interviewing and self-care issues. That's just my two cents. <laughs> I mean, I think having deep knowledge of an of an area is is always going to make you a commodity. That having having languages, having skills in having deep contacts, that always makes you useful. Um, I I think maybe it used to be possible to to be a generalist for your entire career, and I just think that's less true. Where every time you write about something, you're competing with 17 different publications, I think readers look for deep knowledge more now. So, so I think it would be good to tell people, find an area that you can own, whether it's like getting a, you know, learning about, um, you know, learning about um, the industry of like elite cooking and then writing about that or getting a law degree and writing about the law. I just think, or, or moving to a country and really getting deep roots there and then covering it. I guess, I guess to me that, that always seems like the best route. And I think, you know, I've lived through so many waves of layoffs. It's just, I've sort of jumped from lily pad to lily pad my whole career. 
as people were getting, you know, hustled out the door um, with layoffs. But it's also, but there's also exciting things happening. I just see a lot of digital outlets that are investigative, a lot of outlets that are being paid, um, that are being funded through, um, they're being funded through philanthropic organizations. And, and those are really exciting. In New England, where I live, I, I can name three or four that have, have appeared in the last few years. And they're doing really good, tough investigative work. So there's a lot to be happy about. Anissa, any words on building psychological, emotional resilience? Is that something we should be thinking about? in journalist preparation? I guess it depends on the nature of the work. And yes, for some sector, sectors of journalism, that would be really important. Uh, and in general, maybe to understand the human behavior, it, it never hurts to know how to be able to interact with someone you're trying to get their story out, right? So you almost have to be kind of good psychologists in a way to be good reporters, right? So maybe you have this built-in natural or just a decent talent. Human. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good point. And we're a lot cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for. Um, I just want to say thank you to the panelists. But I had a question. I know you mentioned briefly about ethics and like especially when it comes to trauma and reporting, how do you decide like whose story you tell or like, like I guess trying to um, balance that person's trauma and their privacy with like reporting it. It's kind of, I think you mentioned like, you know, you're trying to get the best quote sometimes, but how do you balance that? This is a really great question. And it's one that I think is, um, it's a contested question Right, right now, I can think of a number of cases where we had, especially young people who wanted to talk about their mental health struggles and wanted to go on the record with their name. And there are cases where we have said, you know, it, it, the, the safer thing is, is, is for you to be anonymous because, because of concern, exactly as you say, about like what it means to be to be public with a story about yourself that's very vulnerable. Um, and I think, especially a newspaper like the New York Times, the impact is really powerful on a person to tell your story through that outlet. And so I think we're much more careful about warning people, this is what it's like to be quoted um, and being careful about overexposing people to you know, all kinds of attention that you get, especially online. Um, I think as I've gotten older, I've gotten more careful. Um, I talk through sort of the process a little bit more carefully with people. I don't know if you would agree. Absolutely. I mean, to begin with, um, in this career where I have now, there is a very specific process that I have to go through in or before I interview someone that did not exist when I was a journalist. And I, I mentioned it briefly earlier in my answers, which is a informed consent process. It's not something that we did at all as journalists. We did a version of it. And Ellen's saying that you're absolutely right. Also, social media has changed things and people are becoming more and more cognizant of how information gets out in different, in different ways. And definitely, I, I think there is an element as people grow more seasoned in the job, let's not say older, <laughs> they, they have, they make different choices. Um, for me, as a human rights investigator, as I said, there's an informed consent process that entails, which is part of the trauma-informed approach to interviewing someone, explaining who I am, what I'm doing, how the information is going to be used, where it's going to be used. And like, you also have to recognize uh, this isn't so generic or formulaic, right? Because you could be sitting with somebody who may not necessarily have the same understanding of the di dissemination of the information the way you do. So you, there are ways to even relay it in, in certain terms where, okay, well, the government will be able to see it. People in your community will be able to see it. Are you comfortable? Would this, ha would this pose a risk for you if this came up? Are you, are you worried about um, 
you know, rep retribution from certain entities. So you go through such a lengthy, I, at times this informed consent process takes a good 15 minutes, at the, which again, time, valuable time that not necessarily journalists on deadlines have. And then um, after that, you ask questions about whether they want their name to be used and not. And, and even with all of that said, there's a whole debate where you then, even where people, you've explained the risks at length and people made a very clear decision that they want their name to be used, whether it's still safe to use it or not. And there's a huge debate whether you make that decision for them or you respect their agency because that is their agency. And if, you, if they said that and that's their consent, you treat people as adults. So there's a huge debate on that separately. But there is a process that we go through that enables us to mitigate as much as possible the, that element. And then at times there's a further debate to that. That being said, also remember that these are best practices that don't always happen. And you see awful examples. Um, maybe the first that come to mind, you, you, I'm sure you, there's a lot of you know, research that has been done about how women in the Yazidi community felt about uh, the way they were treated by journalists, um, the way their stories were taken and packaged and, and how that left them and the impact that that left on them. Uh, it is really horrifying to see the academic studies on that. And sometimes it comes from a place of poor practice. Sometimes it comes from not necessarily you know, malpractice from journalists, but I'm not referring to the Yazidi case, but en general, but sometimes it comes from a place where it takes a moment to realize that certain measures weren't done properly and it's not always very obvious. Uh, but in the case of the Yazidi women, for example, the academic research definitely points out to situations where journalists truly um, did not necessarily approach this the right way in, in sharing folks' stories. This has been a, a fantastic discussion. I think we're running out of time. Um, shall we take one more? Okay, one more. Sorry, I didn't realize how short on time we were. I'll do my best to make it quick. Uh, I know this is a panel organized by the Colvin Center for International Reporting, but is this a topic that should just be more broad and discussed in all avenues of journalism? Because stress is very subjective and reporters cover all kinds of conflicts, both internationally and domestically, whether it be like natural disasters or just continuously covering different types of crime. So absolutely. So the DART Center, for example, which works on the, has a fellowship on, you know, the Ogberg Fellowship, when they invite journalists to that Ochberg Fellowship, and I, I had attended that journalist, that, that fellowship and other colleagues here have attended it too. In fact, the selection of journalists who are there are not all war correspondents. People who cover um, you know, crime, people who cover traffic, people who cover, I'm sorry? School shootings. I mean, well, I mean, but those are obviously very obvious traumatic experiences. I was, I was going more for the less what people would not necessarily recognize as um, any sort of uh, journalism can have that aspect. It's not just uh, uh, stories that have to do with crime or war. I mean, I also think it's happening in police departments and it's happening in, in communities at, at all kinds of levels and our institutions are gonna have to confront it. You know, to the extent that we haven't really set up these support systems for mental, for psychological injury, it's gonna have to happen. And it's probably better to do it um, proactively, proactively than to wait for lawsuits to do it for you. Do you know what I mean? So. Thank you. So. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Thank you. It was a great day. It was so incredible. Thank you so much. <laughs>